humbled to be on this journey with you. I get, um, if you see me getting a little weepy up there sometimes, yeah, it is the presence of God, but mostly I, my heart is overwhelmed when I see how you are. I am so proud of each and every one of you. You encourage when somebody's feeling low. You say a prayer for them. I see hugs and I see handshakes. And I want you to know that that is what God had Jesus die for. So that we can lift one of each other up while we're still here on earth before we get to sing and shout and celebrate in heaven. I'm very happy tonight um, also too because this is a wonderful church of if I ask more than not, it's always a, a yes. Even if they feel a little intimidated or it's a little bit out of their comfort zone, that's where God works is where our uncomfortableness begins. He doesn't really work so much in our comfort zone. I wish that he would, but a lot of times it's pulling us out of our comfort zone. And I asked Paul a while back if he would, if he would speak tonight. And he always has such a humble attitude and a humble heart when it comes to God. And rather than giving me all the excuses of why it was scary and why he couldn't and all that sort of stuff, he just said yes, and he was going to step out on faith. So I'm so glad that he is going to come and share a few words. And I can't think of a better audience and a very better family for him to be around to share what's on his heart. So Paul, God bless you. Bless you, church. It's always wonderful to speak. It's an honor to speak. Thank you, Twyla, for letting me speak. Um, she asked me some time ago, and right after she asked me, I thought, I, I'm going to speak about this. And this morning, I got to reading the Bible, and it just suddenly changed all of a sudden. And uh, But my, my message this, more, this evening it's kind of just the basic salvation message. And, you know, I thought about, at first my title would have been, Why is it hard to live for God? Because it's free. And it's free, so some people take it for granted. Some people don't think it amounts to a lot because it's just very simple. And in salvation, God, the Father, who had, there was, before Christ, there was the law. And Christmas time came. Christ was born. Um, and in, in that, there was a reason, there was a big reason why he was born, a virgin, with the seed from God, because sin was brought to this world, Adam and Eve, and so someone had to pay the price. God could not just say, hey, right here, I'm just going to stop it all, and let's all have a, you know, let's just stop right here, and all sins are forgiven, because in the law, it had to be paid for. And Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, but God's seed. And I thought about that. What a miracle. I mean, that's a huge miracle in itself. But there were so many reasons why he was brought to this earth that way. I think he was a baby. He was a child. He had to be raised by a human mother nurtured and keep in mind Christ is fully human but he's fully God he has all this you know so why would he have to be raised by a human why would he have to be raised up as a child to learn things to learn to speak to learn right from wrong to learn not to get by a car no, I just threw that one in because there was no cars then. Okay. But when you're a parent, 
I mean, you're teaching your kid everything, especially your first kid. You're like, oh, my gosh, don't fall down. You know, in the second or third one, it's like, hey, get, you know, your brother will teach you that stuff. Okay. So, but him being brought to this earth like that and having to learn and having to experience human life means that he knows what we're going through. He knows everything that we're going through. He was tempted. Sin was all around him. He had to put up with being persecuted. And all those things that we, that happened to us. So what I think is so personal, and the walk with God is so personal, the walk with Christ is that he's experienced it all. And if we can just trust in that, and if we can believe that he knows what we're going through, we can take our cares, we can take everything in our life to him, and we can trust that he's got the answer, he knows what, he knows what we're feeling, not just what we're saying to him. And so I thought about that, and so in, in that, in Christ being born, and being raised like that, being, and then fully man, fully God. He, this, this is hard to say. I don't know why it's hard for me to say this, but I'm going to jump ahead. His life, is, he's experienced all those miracles, the guy at the pool, and all those miracles. And then he is going to be crucified. And... They put him on the cross, and he's experienced all that pain, something that we we may never experience any pain like that. We won't experience any pain like that. But also, he was the Lamb of God, no sin at all, no blemish, no... um, Basically, he's on the cross. He's an innocent man on the cross. His mother is watching her son being crucified, knowing he's an innocent person, no sin. And uh, I'm going to get into scripture here. Let's do Isaiah. And, and reading is difficult for me here, so bear with me. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That pretty much covers all our needs and everything that we need to bring. And I thought about that. That's a huge deal. And then the next scripture would be 1 Peter 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. Things of this world. Jesus, God, Christ was not anything about that. His life was not lived around those things. God provided him everything and also the worldly things. Provided his taxes, you know, and... So, but from, let's see, this is a little bit different than what I'm used to reading, but um, so if you go down, so he came from, it wasn't corruptible, but if you go down to 23, having been born not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, he was born of God, the seed of God. He had, as a, through the word of God, which lives, abides forever. So he was brought no sin. He was tempted, but no sin in his life. And the thing that I have hard to say is when he was crucified, he cried out, and this is something that I've cried out, Myself, personally, (laughs) not being proud of it, but 
something similar to this throughout life. My, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The lamb with no sin cried that out. I believe he cried that out because he knew we were going to think we were forgotten. That, and the reason why we think that is because we're living in the flesh. And we have to abide, you know, we got all the laws and everything. And we have sin in our life. Everybody's got forgiven, salvation. I thought about salvation. And to be saved, salvation is easy. There's just, all you have to do, it's so easy that everybody can do it. A blind person can be saved. A person that can't hear can be saved. All walks of life people can be saved. And he's made it that easy for a reason. So to be saved, confess your sins, ask forgiveness, and believe. And believe is the big part of it. You know, when I was saved in this church, I came down to the altar. And I can remember coming down here, my hair was down to my butt. Um, and I didn't know one thing about the Bible. I don't think I hardly even read a scripture in the Bible before I got saved. So I came down to this altar knowing my life was a mess. And I heard someone speak, and I read a few scriptures, and I thought, this is what I need. This could be my answer to get out of my life. And I, ha I was having a pretty rough life right then, and the devil was all over me, and sin was easy. And I knew sin, but I didn't know Christ. And I came down by faith. And that's why, you know, I thought... My message would be named, Believe, Faith, and Trust. Because you're going to give your life to Christ, and you're going to believe. And what you, don't, what you can't gather, and you're a child in Christ, and you're young at this, you're going to have faith for the rest. So, I was thinking about Christ on the cross, and crying out, why have you forsaken me? But with him was a man that was a thief, that was an actual thief that had sin in his life, that was being crucified, and he was, just a, they, he was justly being crucified. He was justly being killed, because in the law it said, if you are a thief, you're to be killed. And this man looked up, he was on a cross next to Christ, looked up to him and said, remember me. And that, that sinner, that man who didn't know Christ, probably didn't know a thing about it, but saw what he saw on the cross, a lamb, a person innocent being killed, and asked, remember me, in paradise and Christ looked down at him and said this day you're you will be saved and you we will see each other in paradise roughly the transversion but that that was the first man to be saved and just think it was a thief who was justified to go to death, but yet Christ saved him. And that's, to me, is such a huge deal. The first person was somebody unworthy, very much unworthy. And Christ pulled him up out of that and said, this day we will be together. That is kind of just a regular salvation message right there and it's so simple and so easy 
But yet, I mean, there's a lot to it to believe. There's a lot in belief. You got to have faith. You got to trust. But it's so easy, and Christ designed it like that. God, the Father, designed it like that. So we could come to him in any condition that we're in. If you're not saved tonight, if you're not sure you're saved tonight, or if you're not saved at all, if you've been around church forever, if this is the first time in a church, you can be saved right now tonight. All you have to say is, forgive me. I believe in you. Forgive me of my sin. And that's, that's basically all you have to do. It's so simple. But yet, it's the biggest step in your life as you start believing and having faith in God. And that's a real simple message. But the Bible's so big and thick, and there's so many words in it. Why is there so many words in the Bible? Because that message right there, your life is going and everything. And I thought about that. I thought, once you're a believer, and you're in a Bible-based church, and you're reading the Bible, and you're wanting to get better and better, and you're wanting to overcome your sin. Because when you come down here to this altar, and you say, I want to receive you, Christ. I need you. That sin is, is cleared away from you, but you've got the old human body still there, and it's going to be a battle. And you can beat it through Christ, through the word of Christ. And I thought, there's so many words in that, and this is going to just be a sidebar. But I was up, a storm was coming in. And I thought, you know, everybody says you're always going to, you, two things you're going to have to do is death and taxes. Okay, death and taxes. I'm going to add one tonight and say you're going to be in a storm no matter what. You can say death, taxes, and the storms are coming. Everybody's going to be in a storm in their life. And they're going to have to trust and believe in Christ for that storm. You've, been, you've reached salvation. You've asked God into your heart. And here comes the storms. And I thought, the Bible's there and all that instruction. It's like an owner's manual. It's like a, you know, it's like a manual for your life. And some people won't use that information or those things, or they won't listen to the pastor preach or other people speak. And I, I, I don't know why I always bring this up, but I couldn't read until I was, and I, I had spoke to someone about this earlier this week. And it meant a lot to me because for 18 years I would keep that a secret. But now, God, I far even through that so for me I had to be instructed different ways reading was tough so I listened to people I listened to adults I picked out people who man they've got it together these people are going somewhere and I think you know they're living a good life and they're a good person and I listened to what they would say Anybody can lead you astray, but I would pay attention to those people. I would pay attention to Brother Yarbrough, what he would say, how he would act, what he would say. Some other uh, elders in the church at that time. When I came down here, when I was first saved, I tell you who came down with me was I came down, didn't know what I was doing, and Penny Wright came down with me and... Ruth, I guess that's Jimmy's grandmother, came down and prayed with me. And I can remember looking in their eyes saying, and, and she said, it's okay. You're going to make it. You're, everything's going to be fine. I was tearing up. I was, you know, and, and it became good and fine. And those elders of the church really helped me through that and I think that's something that the youth can do today is look at those people that are doing well 
and take a note of their lives. And that's why it's important for us to live good lives because there are, people are watching us. And uh, not to be fake, but just do the best you can in Christ. But the storms come, and I was out. I've got a, I've got a building. I got a bunch of carports, and I've got a bunch of trailers with equipment on them. And I thought, okay, I've got a building. I got my equipment in there. I've got my carports. It's sheltering things. And then I got some equipment with just tarps over them. And I kind of thought that's kind of the stages that you can take in the Bible. You can use your building, and you can work on getting a building and sheltering your life with that. Or you can maybe not do as much studying and praising God and encouraging people and, you know, really going after it in Christ. And you can have a carport for your stuff. But I was covering my equipment up with a tarp and I walked away from it and I turned around and the tarp already had started blowing off of it. And I thought, I don't want my life, I don't want to just use the armor of God as a tarp. You know what I mean? I want to receive all that word in that Bible. It's this thick. I want to study that, I want to look at it, and I want to ask other people, how can I build my shelter? Because the storm's coming. Death, taxes, and the storms in your life are going to be here. Prepare. And it's simple, and it's dig into the word. It's having fellowship with other Christians. So beyond your salvation, which is the greatest miracle there is, Christ being born, being on the cross, dying for us. He, he died for that thief right next to him. He died for him. That was, and God sent his son to die for that man. He died for you, and he died for me. And I praise God. Thank you for the opportunity to praise. But just remember, tonight you can be saved so easy. Just say, Lord, forgive me, and I believe in you. And I'm going to have faith that you're going to take me home from here. Amen, church. Thank you. Paul, that was great. Thank you so much. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> I just want to say real quickly before they sing the closing song, he asked for come as you are. That's what I would like for you to do tonight. Just come as you are to Jesus. Are you tired? Are you confused? Have you lost the passion, the drive? Are you just upset? Whatever it is, don't try to hide it. Don't try to carry it any longer. Just come and lay it down at his feet. But then I don't want you to stay there. Because when you become a Christian, becoming a Christian and a follower of Christ means that you are now going to serve. So after you lay down your burden and ask God to fill you up, then what I would like for you to do if you want to be in the shelter like he talked about when those storms come and have a firm foundation, maybe tomorrow when you wake up, why don't you ask God, what can I do for you today? Who can I encourage today? And I promise when you give out, that makes more room for God to pour in. But tonight I want it to be about you because you need to fuel up for this next week. So come as you are to him. Broken, sick, tired, confused, whatever it is, that's his specialty. He makes masterpiece out of messes. He doesn't run away from a battle. And if your world seems like it's impossible, I have good news. He specializes in the possibilities. So tonight, just let him fill you up. God bless you. So let me see if I can get through this. <laughs> you know, when Job was sick, it's really easy to complain. And man, he had a lot to complain about. But it didn't turn around for him until he prayed for somebody else. And before I've talked with sermons, if, if you're going through a certain situation, then 
you already know your story. God's already heard your prayers. Pray for somebody else. And that healing will come back to you. And I want to commend this precious soul. Her name is Christy. If you haven't met her, she's a friend of Tanya. And because of Tanya being a light, Christy is also here and she is a light. She has plenty of reasons for her to say, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And it's okay to ask for that prayer, but tonight, what I saw her do, and it makes those of us who have good feet think we're too tired, we're just going to go ahead and stay back there, but it hurts her to walk. She has a walker, and she came to the altar, and I thought, yeah, that's, that's good, God touch her, but see, she had a different mission. She came to the altar, no matter that it hurt, no matter that she was weak, to pray for somebody else. God is going to move in her life. Because tonight she broke chains that the enemy was trying to put on top of her with her health. And restoration is coming to her house. Restoration is coming to her body. And she's going to be so strong here real soon. You watch because you can't give out for God that he doesn't pour it into you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. And I'm so proud of you, and God bless you, Christy. Dear Heavenly Father, this wonderful group of people that's here tonight, Lord, I don't know their situation, but you do. But Lord, I'm asking that they start fresh tomorrow, not walking in the same attitudes, the same hurts, the same discouragements, I'm hoping that tonight that they laid it down at the altar and said, here, God, you take it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of going around the same mountain, the same confusion, the same torn between both sides, not knowing what to do. I'm just going to give it to you. And instead, I'm going to focus on why I'm here in the first place. And that's to live for you and to make your kingdom grow. So, Lord, help us as we wake up in the morning to take our focus off of what we need Pray for those that have the same needs that we do. But Lord, help us to remember that we're here on a mission for you. And when we call you Lord, that means that you are the one that we serve. So help us to have a servant's heart, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to know who you want us to reach out to to make this world a better place. And as we do that, I know I don't even have to ask you. I already know that you're going to pour into these wonderful souls as they pour out for you. But I am going to ask a special blessing because they're close to my heart. See, these are the people that I journey with. So, Lord, I ask for a special anointing and a special peace to come upon them. I ask for you to give them favor with, with their responsibilities, favor with people, and favor with their jobs. I ask that you give them health in their mind and their body and their spirit. I ask that you give them wisdom and you touch their finances and you give them a song within their heart and a joy within their heart. And you let them for the first time maybe in their life deal with how much love that you have for them and teach them to love their self so that they can give that love out to others. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray, amen. God bless you. I hope you have a fantastic week.